Um, so 19th of June is World Sickle Cell Day, a day set aside by the United Nations 12 years ago to raise awareness of sickle cell at a national and international level. In December, 20, in December 2008, the United Nations General Assembly adopted a resolution that recognizes sickle cell disease as a public health problem and one of the world's foremost genetic diseases. Um, sickle cell disorders are a group of illness which affect the red blood cells. It is passed from parents and it means you cannot catch it from other people. Sickle cell disorders also causes normally round and flexible blood cells to become stiff and um, sickle shaped, stopping the blood cells and the oxygen they carry from being able to move freely around the body and causing pain. This can cause episodes of severe pain, which are referred to as sickle cell crisis. People living with SED are in the extremely vulnerable group and have to be shielded as we battle the coronavirus pandemic. Joining us virtually to speak on the struggles of sickle cell warriors. Okay, um, our guest is not available at the moment, but um, once we get him, we'll try to have more conversation regarding how um, coronavirus is affecting them and what's the theme for this year is really Hi, about. It. Okay, so we have him. So joining us um, is the co-founder of Crimson Bull Sickle Cell Initiative, a faith-based non-organization, non-governmental organization that seeks to reach out to people who lives um, or have been affected by the sickle cell condition. His name is Greg Emuze. Hi, Greg. Hi, Elsie. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to have you. So, um, I mean, I know you've been at the forefront of this because it is a personal thing for you as well. How would you say mm -hmm. the virus or the pandemic is affecting those living with the condition, especially regard in regards to access to health care? Also, um, as you know, people living with sickle cell have um, already underlying um, health conditions conditions that make it uh, that make them really vulnerable so we are classified as um, part of the vulnerable population and so shielding is very important i personally had to go through so many hoops just to get access to an account of mine that i didn't have any access to without going into a branch because i didn't want to go into a branch during this period it's just not safe for people like me to be out there in this period so um it's really important that um, we stay away from any form of um, interaction as much as we can so that uh, we do not, not even come down with the virus because our um, uh, the outcomes of people living with SCD with coronavirus is, is quite um, is not as good as um, other people. So it's really important that we avoid um, getting infected in the first place because I mean we already have an underlying um, health condition that could easily affect and you know sometimes we already have respiratory issues and the chances of having something like an acute chest syndrome um, crisis. Um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, just to go away from the virus a little bit into more about the, the sickle cell itself, um, I find it very interesting that it is, well, I say it's, it's almost demographic in the sense that it seems to only be roaming around certain areas of the world. Like I'll live, go to some cities and it looks like I'm speaking gibberish because no one has even heard about sickle cell anemia. What, 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 what is the reason behind that? Is this, is, do the cells sickle in certain climates or is it just yeah yeah you you'll be correct in a sense so it's um this this might this might sound very funny but the best explanation science has for sickle cell is mosquitoes so basically in this part of the world where mosquitoes and malaria is, pan, is um, endemic we um our, our genetic growth over the over thousands of years, you know, dictated that we build some sort of resistance against malaria and mosquito bites. So that was why the S gene itself was, you know, designed in the human body to combat malaria. But um, what the issue, the fallout of that is that when S and S come together, it now becomes a problem, you know. So the more every day we learn, so now there is C and all the rest, and all of them are issues like that when they come together. I've actually been in that situation where I was in the country and you know, I was ill and, you know, that, I was even in Africa, South Africa, and I was in a hospital and the doctor had never had to deal with a patient that had SCD. Wow. So what I did was I had to call home, you know, to speak to 
uh, my own doctor to speak to her, to guide her on what to go about it. So yes, it's not, um, it's not everywhere in the world. It's in certain parts of the world and with certain races, Asians, Hispanics a bit, and then Africans, people of African descent and stuff like that. So yeah, it's not like, um, it's not everybody's headache, so to speak. Mm -hmm. But the problem or the challenge is that it is more of a burden in Africa, especially Nigeria, it looks like the sickle cell capital of the world. And um, it's one of the reasons why I argue that uh, there hasn't been much um, attention paid to it because, I mean, it's not everybody's problem. Thank you for that. Thank you for that, Greg. Um, but let's focus on um, the compatibility rate for people that are planning to get married or they're dating their um, spouse right now and they don't even know their blood genotypes and all of that. So let's just speak about compatibility and say what genotypes should be together and what shouldn't. Okay, so um, one of the things I'd like to say before I go into everything else is the fact that you do not marry a genotype, you marry a person, right? So, but the fact is, um, like Cypher said in the Fast and Furious series, the only thing you can give a human, the thing you can literally give a human being is uh, information. So are you informed about the decision that you're making? Are you just making decision because it feels right and you say, oh, I love this person and so but I mean, no one is going to come and, you know, flog you in your house or force you know, to marry a certain, in fact, Love seems to, well, the kind of love we see in romantic movies seems to explode the moment you tell them they can't be together. That's the time the thing starts to boil as if no tomorrow day. But the point is, um, you can't force someone to, and uh, tell them who to marry. But I just plead that people should go in informed. You know, I was once on a radio station and someone called in and she was saying, what's the big deal? If I marry the person I love and we have a child and a sickle cell, we will treat the child. And I asked her a simple question. I said, how long can you hold your breath? And she was like, eh, she's not very sure. I said, oh, wow. Okay. Now, I've been in pain where I had to hold my breath before because every time I breathe in and breathe out, I feel the pain rush all over me. Mm -hmm. How long did you think I was able to do that? It's very, it, it can be very crazy when you get into a crisis. You don't want to bring your child into that kind of life. You know, mm -hmm. my dad, my mom, they've all been through so much. And sometimes I just feel like I wish I didn't have to bring this up on them. It's bad for you as a warrior. It's bad for your parents. It's bad for everybody around you, your friends. And if you don't have a, a, you know, a strong social circle that holds you up, it's a really terrible place to be. Mm. So yeah, marry so who you important. like, but be informed. Be informed, know what you are getting into. Mm. And that is one of the reasons why the coalition is championing the cause for, pre, I'm sorry, for um, newborn screening for sickle cell. Mm. Yeah, I was going to hope that you can that touch me. on that before we go because of time. So I know okay. one of the things we are focusing on now, raising awareness this year, is the newborn screening. How can mm -hmm. that help very quickly? Okay, so wait. Um, there, was a, there was a survey that was done sometime in 2018 in Benin, in a, in a hospital in Benin, and 71% of the, of the mothers that gave birth to the children, they did not even know their genotype. And at the end of the day, about... Um, you know, the acceptance rate for reads was about 90 something percent, 99, 98 percent, because people actually wanted to know that, oh, I don't know my own, I don't know my child's own. And this is really important because knowing the genotype of a child from the outset increases the, uh, the, the life outcome of that child. One of the reasons why I think my own journey has been a lot less fraught with challenges than a lot of my peers was because my parents found out very early when I was one year old. And in other countries, we've seen that a mobility rate does the, 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 the chances of living and dying, you know, chances of death reduces from like 16% to about 1% when you know on time what this child is. I mean, when a doctor comes to a scene, whether you walked it by yourself or it's an emergency, the first thing they do is take history. He's going to ask someone what happened or who, how are you feeling? If a doctor doesn't know, if your family doesn't know, the people around you don't know that you have a certain condition, then of course your chances of going anywhere in life is very much reduced. So that is why we champion the cause that let us know um, do whatever you like, but let us know who we are at the genetic level. Mm. Thank, Thank you, you, Greg, for your time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's a lot of conversation going on around sickle cell in Nigeria. Like, it's becoming something that at least the younger ones are quite aware. And before they get married, they're encouraged to actually have the test to understand if they're mm. compatible for reproduction and mm. all that. So I hope that some more people will pay attention because yeah. just getting married for love mm. 
the I've seen a friend of mine go through the crisis, and I can tell you that it is yeah. not a child's play. Yeah, uh, I have family. We have a lot, uh, quite a few people in the family that have the virus, but we also um, said the virus, sorry, the condition. the condition. And it's also very interesting that we have new couples in the family that wow. have the possibility of getting a child with that crisis and still decided to get married even though the whole family was saying no and everything so yeah it's really tricky i'm glad to see that somebody with the um who is a warrior themselves is warning against it saying that it's not worth it and it's very unfair to the child but at the end of the day people will still decide who they want to love and how they want to love and i can't um in any i don't have any rights to say otherwise to them but um you know it it, it is a very unfortunate situation it's okay to want to marry who you love, but I, I always say that marriage is not just all about you and the person you're getting married to, unless you don't want to bring a life into the world. But if you're going to bring a life, if you plan on reproducing, then you should take into consideration that child, their happiness, their safety, their, their livelihood, to be precise. So it's not about you marriage is a lifetime thing and it's something that would involve others that's so got stakeholders mm. yeah so <laughs> you, you can't be selfish about it mm. love is not enough i think they'll argue selfish. otherwise as well it's hard to tell people what to do and i don't think it's that simple because just because you both of you are in the they same don't bring a life into the world it's not a hundred percent guarantee that because both of you have the, ha, a carrier as means that you have children with a um, with the sickle cell there's a lot of people who have been lucky so we to have that, that so you have, it, it's it, it's not your your say i think everyone who sits in that situation will have to choose whether or not they want to go ahead with the race and it also has to be economically stable i think to so actually too. do that because um there is actually a way to screen the child while the child is actually still in the womb and even when you give birth to the child and the child is a carrier there are procedures but that procedure is not if i don't think it's readily available in africa uh, no it's, it's a, not it's, it's a western only when, thing and it's, it's only when it's you're not, 18 actually so and you have to even pass the test yeah so you, if you have and get a donor yeah so, yeah so it's it's a long one